Great. So uh, at least we have a recording of it and uh, then we can uh, maybe somehow upload it. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry again about all the technical issues. Some things are not in our control. And uh, this is what we have. Yeah. So yeah, nice to meet you all after these uh, introductions. And now I'll be happy to get your introduction yourself. And let's start with you, Eyal. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. So uh, thanks, Gabriel. And hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm Eyal. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Lunar Dev. And Lunar Dev is basically pioneering the concept of API consumption management. Basically, we're that layer to give you full understanding of all of the third-party APIs that you're using and consuming at scale, and then understanding automatically how to optimize and manage those APIs. Um, so it's built on top of our API consumption gateway, and um, we're like a new concept within cloud infrastructure and API management. And uh, once again, happy to be here, and uh, thank you so much, Gabriel. Yeah, and we're happy to have you here. I actually heard about Lunar from a friend on the marketing side like a year ago. And I was like, hey, how anyone haven't think about it yet? So great to see also startup in the way that we are consuming API. Uh, and yeah, and I think now it's uh, we can give to Akshara. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks for having me here. And I'm Akshara Savant, currently based in London, a developer advocate at Salesforce, focusing on MuleSoft, uh, which is like um, API management tool. I mean, I couldn't say API management tool. It actually has a lot to offer when it comes to APIs and integration, right from API design to API, uh, exchanging your APIs on portal, uh, creating your own API portal as well, securing your API, basically supports the entire API management lifecycle. And it's also now powered with AI stuff. So yeah, it has a lot of stuff when it comes to APIs. Um, Apart from that, I am a co-author. I recently co-authored a book, MuleSoft for Salesforce Developers, uh, if you want to get started with the basics of MuleSoft. So yeah, that's pretty much all about me. Yeah. Thanks, Gabriel. So yeah, great to have you here. Um, so let's start with the title of this live stream, how to use or develop API in the AI era. What mm -hmm. if from your perspective, what you can share, what you feel that change, what is the things that you feel um, accelerate exponentially with the AI in our life? Yeah, so maybe I'll uh, I'll pick it up, Akshara, if uh, if I may. Yeah. Um, and I want to actually answer that question from the perspective of what has changed with with APIs in general. I mean, you got the API economy for such a long time. There are so many APIs out there from freighting to travel to uh, e-commerce. And then like in recent, I'll say like in the recent years, we've seen that booming of of AI APIs or LLM APIs from OpenAI to Mistral to uh, um, Anthropic. And I think that the way that those APIs are consumed, there is something fundamentally different than the other APIs. Um, one of the fundamentals of it is what you can maybe we can perceive as a new type of currency. And that currency is the token that you're using. Every prompt that you're sending to those gen AIs is being translated into a number of tokens. There's like that ratio of uh, um, like uh, 70, like a ratio of one to three approximately. Um, and we're seeing that every prompt being sent to an API of the AI's APIs is associated with the number of tokens being uh, um, being used. That new currency is something that we haven't seen with other type of APIs. And this is a currency that actually needs to be keeping track of because that token, uh, that consumption of token is actually correlated with cost. I mean, you're paying for the number of volume of tokens you're being consumed for those APIs. This is something that is different. We haven't seen it with other APIs. Um, and that calls for another thinking of the way that uh, we will use those APIs and we will use it efficiently. Do we need to make every API call? Do we need to make the API with the prompt as big as possible? Maybe we need to think of better ways to make it lean as possible. And I think that that shift in the way that we're seeing AI APIs taking like the, the, for, the forefront of everything is something that... Uh, fundamentally changed the way that our backend is being written with, has been integrated with those APIs. Um, and 
there's a lot of thinking, both in terms of that tokens, but also in terms of security. I mean, how do I make sure that the prompt that I'm using is um, is sanitized to the way that you're not making some kind of an abuse in the prompts that you're using? Those are questions that we maybe not have dealt with with other APIs, but the new era of AI APIs is definitely something that makes us all think quite differently and in a new approach of how we can actually view that traffic uh, and manage that traffic um, as opposed to uh, other APIs that has been around for so many years. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. Yeah, that uh, what you say about the token and the currency, because uh, from what I feel, we 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 built to think on one way, on the way that we are consuming API, the way that we are modeling rate limiting, for example, the way that we are modeling uh, authentications and permission, etc. cetera. Uh, like Shada, do you, you see that too? You also see that change that um, Eyal is speaking about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, firstly, to back up what Eyal said, there is definitely a lot of things we can leverage from AI when we're building API. And last week, I delivered a talk about AI-enabled APIs, which was mostly about like how AI is influencing uh, our API ecosystem. And mm -hmm. morely, like we have, I mean, I would actually categorize it as like three different aspects. Like firstly, we have ready-made AI-enabled APIs, which we can directly consume. We can integrate them with our application. Uh, secondly, something we can leverage AI is like we can take we, we can uh, take help from AI to write our own APIs, something for code generation, uh, and also the no-code, low-code tools where we can leverage the power of API in the API development process. And third is something like embedding an API with your LLMs and getting the response out of this API. You're making actually a backend call to these APIs and via your LLMs. So I, these are the three topics or three things that I have identified. Oh, I can, I have got your request to enable the video. Oh, yeah. So okay, that yeah. <laughs> from phone. Sorry that I disrupt you. Uh, you can all now start your video. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Great. Yeah. Hey, Philip, we have hey, here Philip. also Philip, our developer advocate at Permit that will also help oh, us. Amazing. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Yal. Hey, likewise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry. So, yeah, you can, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, can you come up with the question again? Yeah, so we did, we did um, Eyal bring a very interesting like uh, perspective for the way that we are looking on the way that uh, we are consuming API. It is not anymore about the way we used to think built on an endpoint, built on the atomic way that we are calling mm -hmm. API. We are now calculating it in a different level of abstraction, right? And we call it token sure. and currency. And I asked, what do you think about it? And if you're familiar with the terms and the way to do it. Yeah, I mean, what Yael said, I was completely agree. And as I mentioned, like those three points, uh, when it comes to like, I have actually categorized into three of them, like how do we consume API? How do we get AI into the picture? So keeping that aside, definitely AI is going to have impact in every stage of uh, API management lifecycle, right from the design phase to like management building, sharing, building your application, and then also with the security. And also the, the least favorite part of all of us, like which is API documentation. So I think all of us, we have been avoiding API documentation and that is something we keep for the end. Uh, like, But that is more, so, so much crucial, right? And AI can definitely chip in here and we can build API documentation with the help of AI generators. Yeah, yeah. so that that's very interesting because I think documentation is always a problem for both Problem, sides. yeah. Sorry? Yeah, that's definitely a problem and something we definitely procrastinate. Like, yeah, that is something for later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, speak about documentation. I think it's a, um, it's a very good way to put the light on both sides. Documentation is a problem for the consumer and the creator of the API, right? For the creator, it's hard to create consistent documentation. It's hard to document every variable, every feature on the API that they develop, but also for the consumer, if something is documented problem problematically, it's creating like a, a level of complexity on top of it. What other areas you see that is um, a, a big challenge for the consumer 
and the creator, and especially when it came to the the, the new economy of the API, as the all uh, mentioned before. Do you want to take it, Ayal? Um, so I want to think of my answer like in the best way. Uh, Akshara, if you want to leap in first, uh, if we have to. No, I'm absolutely fine with you going ahead. Okay, cool. Yeah. So <laughs> there's like one topic in specific that I want to talk about documentation. And from the, once again, some somewhat from the provider side. So we know that documentation is a hustle and it's a pain and all, we always need to keep track of the documentation one point of time. I'm not just thinking, and I'm thinking not only about the difficulties, but also on the opportunities of um, AI and documentation. And I'll explain. I mean, thinking about AI and the way that it can abstract the way that uh, we will be interacting with API providers, it means that it's not on us, the developers, uh, to learn how to to uh, you know to, to read the documentation, read through it. But maybe someone can do it for us, that AI, and do the gist for us. Um, so in a way, all of those changes that might not be documented, uh, like in real time, can actually be mitigated by an AI. I mean, AI will be that component that will understand what has changed in terms of documentation, uh, reading th back and through it. And make the proper adjustment automatically based on um, based on that. And this is like one angle that I'm thinking of documentation. But the other angle is that maybe with AI we're not we don't need to think that much about reading through the documentation and uh, you know implement code on top of it. And I'll explain as well. Mm -hmm. It's it's something that like based on the usage pattern that we're seeing. Uh, we can understand, or maybe like that AI component will understand how to consume efficiently in a way that we're seeing over time, what is the rate limit? Even if it's not like, if, even if it's poorly documented and it's not out there, just based on the pattern of consumption, seeing that like uh, that yeah. type of, uh, you know, consumption. Uh, um, exactly. Amplitude. We can detect, I mean, AI will be able to detect that usage pattern and understand how close are we to the rate limit? Uh, when are we going to get there? And and assuming that we know what will be like the rate limit, how can we consume more efficiently? Like, let's say, prioritize API calls based on the unallocated, based on the number, like the, on the quota that we got left. So I'm seeing a lot of challenges with AI and, and documentation, but I actually flipped your question a bit, Gabriel, and I'm thinking about like actually the potential of using AI to overcome problems with documentation and learn for us the way that we can actually uh, don't read, need to read every documentation other as consumers of so many APIs, but we can actually be reliant on that abstract layer of AI to actually consume better for us and tell us like the, the insights of what has fundamentally changed than the last version that we've deployed. Uh, and that actually will be like a multiply force for us rather than, uh, you know, it's something that we can harness to our advantage. Yeah, speaking, I'll actually add on top of that, because speaking about the advantages in documentation, I think me and Gabriel here, we, we both work on the marketing team and we're both very kind of engaged in writing the, the documentation for the end users. Now, one thing that we that we often find, or in other words, one thing that uh, when you approach to write documentation, you have to really put yourself in the shoes of the end user, because it's very easy for us to write documentation that we are familiar with and write a long, long, you know, page explaining everything that, you know, the user should do. But then on the other side, you have the end user coming forward and, and suddenly they read it and they're like, well, actually, you know, this might make sense to us, but it doesn't really make sense to him. Mm -hmm. And then I find that the big advantage with AI and documentation right now is the fact that the AI can in some way summarize, it can extract all the relevant information for the user, or the user can prompt the AI to explain things in a different way than it's written because that gives us kind of a fallback mechanism on the on the supposedly the mistakes we made in documentation of maybe writing it incorrectly or going into too much detail uh, when it really wasn't necessary for the for the user to understand right or to get all the information true also i guess i would like to add like whenever we are uh, documenting an api uh, and if we have implemented security or if we haven't implemented security that is something to be coming in the later stage and that is something we often neglect or maybe we do not add information around that aspects as well the token consume i mean how are we going to consume the token how are we going to consume basically the apis and stuff so in such situations i think ai can be helpful in giving a proper holistic view of what our api is doing 
where is the data coming in from? And to some extent, also with the diagrams or graphs, like uh, how is our entire uh, API ecosystem? Like where is actually the data coming in from? What are the end systems? So it gives a, a overview kind of, of our architecture. Actually, actually, Gabriel, thinking uh, also about something that that Philip mentioned as someone that uh, like is writing documentation, and you need to be in the mindset of your user. user and true. one of one of the revolutions that we're seeing with AI is the revolution of personalization. So, like taking it one step ahead and thinking that, what if you have the ability? I mean. An AI layer will have the ability to understand the way that you're consuming an API, your usage patterns, and then adapt the documentation tailored to your need, like a personalization in the way that the documentation is being written to you. That might not be that handy with simplistic APIs, but APIs with so many endpoints and like really complex APIs and GraphQL APIs, those can be like a true advantage and like a true force multiplier to know that the documentation has been tailored to your needs, the way that you consume that API. And I think that we'll see that, we might see that pattern of personalization in the way that documentation is being written and being handed out to the user uh, based on the way that AI can learn on your usage patterns. Uh, that is a, that is a great point. I personally came across a situation many times where I wanted to use an API and it had just a whole book of endpoints. And then my question is, okay, which ones do I use? How do I find them? How useful would it be if I can just say, hey, this is my problem. This is what I do. Just give me the API endpoints that I really need, right? Uh, how tailored? You know, that's 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 the customization I think we're, we're seeking in in the tech space. Yeah, I think from this perspective of like personalize the APIs for the users. One of the mm -hmm. things that is very natural today for people who develop APIs and also for API consumers is using SDK. SDK is actually, we can think about it like a personalization of API for a platform, for a language, right? So we have an API, but we want to make it work better with Next.js or with a Go language. So we are creating SDK that making it easier. And um, I think personally that AI changing um, significantly the way that we are doing SDK from many angles. So for example, generation of SDK, we see startups in the field that generating much better SDK nowadays with APIs. But it also has a challenge if I'm, if I'm looking of what um, Eyal said about the new currency of consuming APIs. SDK can be also a challenge in the way that we are letting all the user to consume API. Because for example, SDK in AI APIs can make user do redundant call or don't think about the way of the manage the economy of the API. So how do you think the SDK market will change as a result of the AI um, growth? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. I think SDKs and APIs, they, they both of them, they have a totally different purpose, right? I mean, APIs give you like more, uh, more flexibility and over over SDKs. So, uh, I'm not sure how the market is going to be because I have never personally created an SDK, but I have. It's all been around APIs. So I think I'll pass this thing to pass this over to yeah. So I actually wanna. I want to take one step forward what you said, Akshara, and I think because mm -hmm. the value proposition might be a bit different, my claim is a bit bold. I'm saying that, I mean, SDKs will be there. They have their own value proposition. Own value to them. Value. But I'm saying that I think that we'll see much more usage of like direct APIs because as Akshara yeah. said, SDKs are basically abstracting the API for you. So it makes you easier to consume that API and build on top of it. But and it might be handling retries and authentication and caching for you. You got all that bundle as, as an SDK. The mm -hmm. thing is that is the, as Akshara said, is that it kind of keeps you apart from the API. So True. Um, I think that because we're seeing once again uh, AI as a multi a multiple force that will help you consume that API better in a more efficient way, and and it will become complex. So you need to have that direct connection. I think that we'll see actually much more pattern usage into direct 
uh, uh, integration with APIs and rather than using their SDK. SDK. So in a way you're saying what will be affected, how the SDK in terms of API will be affected. I'm saying that we'll see much more leap and much more like balancing into direct integration with APIs uh, and, and not being wrapped up with SDKs as better, as much as cool and efficient those SDKs might be. There's mm -hmm. no substitute to actually direct connection with the API provider and each and every endpoint that you want to consume with. So I have a question there that I want to throw in. What do you guys think about, because uh, obviously a lot of companies, they they maintain a huge amount of languages for each SDK. Mm. Do you think that causes a problem for the companies? Do you think it makes it more difficult to kind of maintain everything up to date with the, with the latest API changes? Absolutely. I mean, I think I would take this one. So when you say we are having different languages, so that's actually a burden because it's not just in terms of like API management or the resource management you're doing. You're also investing in terms of like human resources. So you need developers with those different skill sets to build different kinds of uh, applications, I would say. So in that case, when you're going with an API, it actually becomes pretty much simple. Uh, with the API development process and now with the AI coming in. So uh, here I'll give you an example. So what we do at MuleSoft is like, if you are a beginner, like um, with the API design that MuleSoft provides on any point platform, it's an iPaaS tool uh, for API designing, managing and like entire thing, like all the API management lifecycle at one place. So if suppose if you're joining as a new developer, so um, you do not have to develop an API from scratch, you'll be like, just like the way we fill in the form, we select like the, for example, if you're filling in your form details, like your name or your, your full name, your first name, last name, your gender, you're selecting some categories. Similarly, in this process, you're selecting the, you're selecting all these attributes basically the API attributes, like you're gonna select the API method or names, the response type, you're just gonna type in the details that you need. And simultaneously an API will be created for you in the, I mean, just in another window. And you can switch between OS format or the RAML format, whichever format you have. So, and further you can go ahead and you can simulate the API, like test out the endpoints if they're giving you correct response output, um, if it's like as per your expectation at the same time. So this is more like a very early feedback at a very early stage. And I think, yeah, that's something definitely like we have to like, uh, the tools need to be switching between different languages and all rather than humans switching between different languages. So that is something uh, will be like helpful in terms of productivity. Yeah, I think the productivity point is one of the, main challenges main that challenge, I, yeah yeah in, in the way that both trying to solve in apis because on one hand apis used to you know um, um, make our productivity better make us create a better application but at some point it's getting harder and harder and i think one of the one of the product that actually built to help us with productivity is um, API gateways or middleware in both sides. So we all know like API gateways for inbound traffic, like Kong and, and uh, maybe even usage of uh, traditional uh, load balancers like uh, Nginx, Nginx, maybe not a load balancer, but yet it's something that people use for, um, for managing API gateways. And that actually um, um, make a better productivity for developers because they know, okay, I have one standard for API, I have one way to manage it all. But now we see, and this is actually what Eyal uh, and his team developing a middleware for the other side, for the egress traffic, for the way that we are consuming API. So um, Eyal, do you want to share what bring you to that? What make you think, hey, we need to do a better productivity. It was only the AI, it was other things that you saw. Yeah, so uh, we actually saw that pattern um, even before the the booming of AI APIs. API, AI APIs gave us some leverage and like prove our thesis that better. But thinking about it, I mean, talking with many companies and witnessing on our own as as engineers ourselves, we saw that companies are basically building their own capabilities all the way to a dedicated egress service to manage their outgoing traffic. It's something that it's pretty known, as you said, with API gateways that have been around for years and you got those awesome API gateways and tools out there to manage the API you provide. But when it comes to the consumption of APIs from your backend, from your application, 
basically where you deal you've been dealing with those problems on your own so you've been developing your own type of tool set or we can call it api middleware uh, to manage that consumption by managing consumption i'm talking about implementing the retries the caching mechanisms the load balancing both to external apis and between internal services authentication all of that tool set we've seen companies building it on their own and that kind of gave us the spark of saying okay if so many teams have been building it on their own and at the mm -hmm. evolution of it, we actually saw like a dedicated team of eight people building an internal service to manage traffic might as well be like that first product in the market that will give you that full management scope and optimization like actively remediating problems with your egress traffic with your outgoing consumption that was like the thesis from the get-go and then ai came to to the world and then we saw like the enormous uh, buzz that has been around AI APIs and the consumption. And then OpenAI came out and then like Mistral and Anthropic and a a AI21 Labs. And like there's a booming of APIs. And now like the recent pattern that we've seen other in the market is a new term called AI Gateway, where basically you got that component focused most, most solely on your outgoing traffic to AI APIs. And the promise of companies saying, listen, you need to manage that traffic in a better way. You need to understand, once again, how many tokens are you consuming and budget your cost control based on the token usage in real time. You need to load balance between different API providers based on accuracy and cost, and you need to have those alternatives. So now we're seeing like a new pattern of management to the outgoing traffic. It's like really become a dominant thing in, in AI APIs. And Lunar is saying like, in a general perspective, you need to manage whatever APIs you're consuming. Might that be AI in particular, but also the, the other APIs you're using. The same way that you're using an AI API gateway for inbound traffic will be the same thing that you need to be used in a different type of tax tech and, and, and technology to the outgoing traffic that you're using. And that pattern only emerged since we started. So we've seen like the booming, not only in AI APIs, but APIs out there. And as much companies become more reliant on third-party APIs, the need to actually abstract that management layer from the application itself is becoming something that is pretty like a predominant uh, uh, and it's out there. Talking about abstraction, what do you guys think about uh, low-code and no-code coming into the space of APIs? So, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Akshat, of course. <laughs> so with the no-code and low-code space, like uh, the abstraction, um, uh, I'm not pretty sure, but when it comes to low code and no code, no code basically, uh, low code API generation. So, I think that is something more I have to I have to discover on that part. And abstraction is like something we have been also like doing currently as well. I mean, even with the current API development or current API process, we have been abstracting the information that is needed. Uh, I mean with the example that I can give you is like uh, with MuleSoft, we have we have been using the API-led architecture. Like suppose if something we are uh, connecting with an external systems and it is the, the API which is going to get us information from the external systems or maybe the backend system, the legacy systems. So we do abstract the credentials. We do abstract the information uh, in the API. So when I'm not sure how AI will be like a, how how AI is going to be uh, adding value to it because we are basically concerned about the security aspect as well. And although we are going to have a trust layer and everything, but still those credentials will still be like kind of be exposed. Um, so, Yael, do you have anything like uh, on this part, like the security, mainly the security aspects when it comes to abstraction? Yeah, I think that uh, um, there's a lot of security that we're seeing when it comes to prompts, right? Prompts, yeah. We got that prompt and you need to secure it in so many levels. But like one of the, the, the things that we've seen in particular about prompts is that how do you make sure that those prompts being used again to, against uh, an allow list? I mean, if you're using terms and those API calls being made, where do you capture and enforce a security policy on top of the outgoing calls of, of prompts? Do you, make, do you wanna make that enforcement when generating the prompt, do you want to make that enforcement on the application level as an API call? Um, so, and alter that. So I think that there's a lot of aspects that is being like, being uh, um, 
th thought about when it comes to prompt security. I mean, making sure that the prompts are against an allow list, making sure that you're not, you, you're not leaking any PIIs out there. Uh, and this is like a thing that we've seen uh, in particular about um, security. Um, yeah, so this is like my my two cents uh, of security and AI in the um, uh, as we've seen it recently. Yeah, and also to add in about the low code no code generators. So for a basic example, like if uh, if you if you give a command to Chat GPT as well, right, write an API to fetch uh, which will include all these methods and to get some customer information. So definitely it is going to give. I mean it. It did give me a response as well. And for all of you, it must have worked as well. So that was a very low level example, I'm sure. But I'm sure like companies who are actually into API development and API making process and all so product based companies, they will be coming up with something like around AI, which will be which will be giving you uh, ability to like generate an API based on the prompts. And I'm sure it's going to be available in different languages as per your requirements, customizable and everything. So that is that is around the no code or the no code generators, which are going to be the future of API. So pretty sure like in few years, I don't think a developer would be worrying about the indentation of API or like if he has missed something or anything around the like all the mess that we have been facing in the years around the api development like the definitely the indentation and then making sure all the resources are included and nothing i mean we have been documenting basically the api designing process prototyping so all these things will be like pretty much taken care of by a product which will be embedded ai in it 100%. And i hope that answers the question philip yeah, it does. I, I think there's a lot in general, there's there's a very common uh, kind of use case mm -hmm. when we see no code. And the most common use case is that we see companies, like you said, uh, AL, we see companies uh, build things themselves. And then suddenly they realize, well, you know, why, why are we building this and wasting all this engineering time on engineering this? We can just outsource this from another company. And it's going to be much more beneficial because at the end of the day, we want to focus on our product and what we're building. And not on something else that might be already built by a dedicated team that know exactly what they're doing. So the security is in place, you know, the implementation is in place. And then I think a lot of companies who design the solution then therefore say, well, how can we abstract this even more? How can we offer this to even more stakeholders? Maybe people who might not be as technical in the company, right? Uh, to outsource this to them. So maybe they can work with it as well. And that's kind of where the no code aspect for me comes in. That's that's kind of, uh, you know, really making things as simple as possible. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, we're in the tech space and the tech space can be sometimes a little bit overwhelming, especially it take, takes time to learn a new skill, uh, whether it's working with APIs or it might be something completely different uh, and the very intrinsics of it. So I think I think that abstraction there is, is really kind of time saving and, and it does offer a lot of benefits, uh, benefits to the to the to the tech community, especially tech teams who are uh, therefore, then, uh, you know, utilizing these tools in their own implementations. I completely agree with you. I think that um, um, like what we're seeing with local no code type of solutions is, as you said, bringing the power of uh, functionality of other API providers, other uh, other services, in the hands of everyone. Might there be technical and non technical, and uh, like the what we call like the uh, uh, civil engineering uh, in a way, right, um, right, and. As you said, they need to focus on their business use case. They do not need to think, and also the R and D being back, being backing them up, do not need to think about the management that associated with it. And the management basically is is understanding that the underlying layer of every low code no code solution is API calls. I mean, you want to yeah. drag and drop something that will be an API call at the end of it, like at the back end of it. So. A lot of API calls being generated. Uh, local no code like, is like helping that expedite. And as you said, we need to push management like out of the out of the picture. Management is something that needs to be dealt in a more sufficient way. So you're not as that civil engineer or the R and D within your company. You need to think about the way that you're managing and authenticating and retries and caching all those. Something we need to take take care of that management so you can keep focus on the business logic that you're using. So local exactly. no code kind of take us to in that in that direction and also spot a light or shines a light where like the next phase in terms of managing all of that 
traffic and API traffic needs to take place. Um, so completely agree with you um, uh, on that. We I, also I, have. Yes, sorry. go ahead. We also have a, a question, not question, a statement basically uh, from an attendee. Like Copilot work is one of the applications to generate AI code. However, this is seen as a co copyright ownership issue around the product. Yeah, which is true. And I think we should actually bring in the Copilot to the picture because I have been actually working with Copilot and APIs. And that, that there is actually a, so much potential, maybe uh, if you want to bring that in. Yeah, I, I actually just wanted to also point in this uh, licensing and stuff because um, as I say that the security aspects of um, the way that AI get involved in our APIs has multiple angles, which I really want to touch uh, some of them. But I think that one of the licensing in ownership is um, super critical and it it's a new challenge for multiple reasons, but I think that what this uh, uh, person in the in the Q and A mentioned is not the main reason about the ownership of what contributed to me. is more the ownership of a private data, right? So the AI bring a lot of private data to be public without us even knowing that, right? Because let's say, for example a company that try to build their model they are using some analysis product analytics product that they have so think about google maybe use private somehow private data from their google analytics but many products also use private data in google analytics without declare it's a private data right so uh what do you think is the challenges of the ownership from the other side from the way that we are not uh, uh, confusing users with data that, with the private data? What is the challenges that AI bring to API in this uh, term? Yeah, do you want to take it? Because I know uh, AI is something that close to your heart. Close to <laughs> the, I'll, I'll say our perspective around PIIs. I think that the challenge that it brings is actually mapping PIIs, right? In every API call, understanding which PIIs are being sent outside, once again, against some kind of an allow, an allow and blacklist. And the way that you can map and both obfuscate dynamically in real time, PIIs is something that it's needed. I mean, when using AI, there's a lot of PIIs being generated. Maybe you wanna have some of them um, sent outside with an API code. Maybe like the majority of them will not be in sent. And this is something that you need to check against. Uh, I mean, whatever prompt is being generated, you need to take, check it against the policy that your organization is being uh, is making. I think that's like the, the easy challenge, by the way. That's the challenges that we can already achieve. The hard, the, like the biggest challenge is, is another layer on top of it. Not like identifying simplistic PIIs, but identifying extrapolation on top of PIIs. I mean, if I have your name and based on the name, I can associate it with something that is related to you as a per person, how will we know how to sanitize that data? It means that we ourselves need to understand the context of it, us like the, the enforcer of it. That's a hard challenge. This is a challenge that, um, I mean, it will be much harder to uh, to answer and understand. And that imposes like the next phase of challenges, not just abstracting and, or maybe obfuscating or eliminating specific plain text known PIIs. This is like the easy stuff. This is like pattern, uh, pattern. Uh, uh, um, I mean, you can detect it based on patterns, stuff like that. You don't, you don't need to have context on top of it, but the context and the uh, understanding on top of PIIs is something that it's a much harder problem to solve and enforce. And uh, I think that that will impose one of the challenges of the next uh, uh, phases of using AI safely in production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, so that's actually one one perspective of the challenge of AI and security, but another one is uh, something that is close to my heart and this is actually streamlining permission. So the way that we are building AI, mm -hmm. AI today, APIs today and the way that we are consuming API today, it's built on a very structured level of permissions, right? So we have endpoints and we have structured and we have everything, but AI actually, the base of LLMs and the base of uh, modeling uh, free language models is about unstructured data. 
uh, how do you see this challenge of security, like streamlining the unstructured permissions and uh, what a user actually can do or not do, what a service can do? I think for that, we need to like, uh, definitely that's going to be a crucial part of security, like streamlining and with the data, with the APIs and everything. But that is something we can actually like up at a product level itself, an API management tool, if that is something like if you are using a one place stop, like a kind of API management tool, we can manage all these permissions. We can manage the access to, uh, I mean, the proprietorship and who is going to get what kind of authority, what level of access. Um, I think we can use an API, a management platform for this too control all of this thing and even though we're going to bring in api uh, ai to our apis uh, it still doesn't take us away from a centralized management place we still do need it to get a um, to get a control over all the apis in the ecosystem and i think that is going to be a single source of control because that's how you manage access to all your apis the incoming outgoing data uh, the pii masking uh, what level of information is going through which system and where has it been carried to. So you actually need a complete visibility or transparency in the API process because with AI coming in, it's going to get more and more complex. So that's when you actually, I think the API management tool, they have to become more and more powerful and in order to accommodate the changes that are coming with AI. So yeah, uh, what, what would you say? Yeah, like... So I'm actually curious about Gabriel. I mean, uh, I'm curious to curious about your uh, perspective and way of mm -hmm. thinking about that challenge. I mean, kind of curious what you have in mind. Yeah. So I, I think what what Akshara mentioned about centralized way to manage policies, which I'm calling from the perspective of someone who creating an authorization product. I think this streamlining of uh, and centralizing policy is a crucial step in the way that we're getting AI involved more and more in the unstructured data. Why? Mm -hmm. Because today, most of the authorization layer and the permission layer in our APIs is oriented by the model of the API themselves. So for example, we have an API gateway, and then we are using a model like role-based access control to say this endpoint is allowed for a particular set of users, this endpoint is allowed for another set of users. Uh, one of the conclusion that I have from our discussion today, and we can even expand on it because I feel we haven't expanded on it yet, is that for long years, we tried to have one protocol, one method, one way to model API. So we are doing REST API, we are doing GraphQL, we are doing uh, um, um, a swap, whatever it is, we try to centralize the way that we are modeling API. And a result of it was a modeling of permission, or modeling of rate limiting, modeling of whatever it is. With the way, the, the way that AI and unstructured data get into the picture, we cannot allow ourselves these services like permission services or rate limiting services being oriented for the, from the way that we are modeling the API, right? Because um, a, a usual consumer of API today consume a lot of types of API. So they can consume HTTP, they can consume gRPC, they can consume it in WebSocket, which is some sort of HTTP, but it's really hard for REST API modeling. And this is where the centralization of this policy also need to be extended for fine-grained authorization. So it's not any more coarse-grained authorization, which again, mm -hmm. uh, oriented by the way that we are structuring the software in a one way, right? So role-based access control mentioned that all the subjects can have roles and they have the, the and then we streamlining the role for one model of permission. But with new models of permission, like attribute-based access control, mm -hmm. we are not looking anymore only on one way to model the subject. We are taking the attributes from all the stakeholders of the permission model, and we are building conditions and building policies on top of them. And I think using fine-grained authorization plus a centralized way to manage the policies of this uh, permission model is a crucial way so, so uh, for developers to be able to use any API in, in no matter what the volume that they are using and no matter what the structure they, they are using, they can trust one model, one centralized model to be one source of tools for permissions. Interesting. 
Yeah. Nice answer, Gabriel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I think um, I, I talk about that we can maybe expand on the way of uh, the traditional willing of centralizing the way that APIs looks like, which now actually shift into a way we want to uh, um, we want to centralize the way that we are consuming API, but we don't want to uh, centralize or unify the way that we that the APIs looks like. And I know that Eyal, um, I think that I already heard you discussed about it about the usage pattern that we see that change in the way that users are uh, consuming APIs. And I'll be happy to hear about it from more, a more like general, for more user perspective, not what AI affect, but what user now changing their usage pattern in, in APIs. In specific, in the, in the context of AI APIs? Uh, in the way that AI affect that, because we already discussed a lot about AI, but I think the way the usage pattern is affect everything, right? So for example, um, for example, we are speaking about two trends, let's say low code and AI, mm -hmm. right? So these two trends that make the consumption and API getting more and more, you know, getting more widely or widespread between users. Mm -hmm. And I think they are, it's a like a symbiotic system, right? We have tons of low code and then the user want better experience. And then we use LLM to give this experience and then the usage pattern that changed is not only in AI, it's in general that the way in use, the user uh, consume and produce APIs. So I'll be happy for an answer on the more wide usage patterns that you see in users when they are consuming APIs. Yeah. So I think that in terms of usage patterns, uh, one thing that we've seen across the board, I mean, not across the board, but like a thing that we've seen out there is kind of, I'll say, load balancing between alternatives. This is something that it's pretty known, uh, as we said, with AI APIs, but it's not only associated with AI APIs. API economy is big. For every type of functionality that is provided with an API, you got an alternative. And now we're seeing companies are not uh, satisfied with just using one API. It kind of makes sense. I mean, if you want to have a resilient backend, you need to make sure that you have some kind of redundancy. If one API goes down, you'll make sure that in, your, in order to continue business continuity, uh, mm -hmm. those API calls will be mitigated or switched to the next API provider. If a region is not supported by this API, then you will use another API provider. Let's say like if Twilio is not supporting Japan, or maybe it's like really costly in Japan, by the way, a real example, then you may be using another API, like the the the, the second best alternative uh, um, in specifically for making API calls uh, to provide you with some kind of an SMS messaging in, in, in Japan. So switching alternative based on business logic, might that be cost or accuracy or um, um, availability is something that we've seen as an emerging type of pattern, not an emerging, I mean, it's emerging with AI, but like a pattern that we've seen other you can see much more apis being consumed um uh, by the same uh company because they want to load balance the traffic they want to you know make sure that every a call is being uh, as resilient as possible and this is like one thing another thing that i think that uh cost is being something that it's been much more in conscious uh, i mean developers are using it consciously right now because there is a cost associated with API consumption, right? Depends on the business model. You got APIs that are being cost on the single API call. You want you have API calls that are priced on on uh, on, on tiers. But might that be we're seeing that a lot of the billing at the end of the month is actually being shifted to the third party APIs you're consuming. Mm -hmm. That actually calls for better controls and consciousness when you can when it comes to consuming APIs. You need to have, and we've seen it as a pattern, we need to have some kind of a cost control, a budget control on the number of API calls being made. That actually makes tons of sense, a perfect sense with AI APIs, uh, like in, in general. That actually is something that I think like the latest version of OpenAI um, panel provides you with. I mean, you can have detection of what is the associated cost or like the correlated cost with API calls being made. Because this is something that we've seen much more become taking the forefront of saying, listen, I understand that the billing at the end of the month will be 
also built on the number of API calls being made uh, and it's accumulating, like we'll see it grow as time goes by. And we've seen a usage pattern being shifted in a way that uh, companies want to understand how much they're consuming in real time and then distribute the budget accordingly, maybe like restricted. And also in a way saying that, okay, if I have like a limited budget that I want to use, then I need to think in a fine-grained manner how I'm distributing those API calls for my users. So maybe like the most prioritized one, the VIP customers will get like availability to outgoing API calls and the freemium tier will get either like low prioritized or maybe being shifted to a less accurate AI API model. So that shift between, okay, segmentation of your customers and the way that they're propagating API calls uh, based on the model is something that we also seen as an emerging pattern. Freemium companies will use uh, open source, uh, small LLM models, and premium customers will be getting the access to chat GPT-4, for example. This is like a pattern that is becoming recently out there and, and calls for better management and controls over API consumption. I, I think that's... Yeah, go ahead, Akash. Sorry. Yeah, I think I would like to add something like I definitely resonate with what Yal said, like around the load balancers having um, like around API consumption and all. Uh, I mean, I also feel that API portals can also help us out here, like creating an API portal. Like suppose if you're as an organization, if you're building large number of APIs and you are a big organization which and you have APIs coming across from um, like different groups, several uh, several projects and it it actually becomes quite uh, easy when you share these APIs. You're, you're saving your time building the redundant APIs and also you're making sure that the APIs are being consumed. So if you build something like an API uh, portal um, and there are several like products which will help you to build your API portal, just like the way we have our apps listed down on App Store, Play Store, uh, where we can see like what kind of APIs we have. And like the way, ex the example Eyal just gave us, like suppose if Twilio is not supported in the, um, uh, in Japan or maybe basically regional or geographical differences. So at such level, we can just have something like templates which are readily available and just consuming those templates will actually save us time rather than having like end-to-end -end, like, um, for example, if you're using the Twilio, instead of Twilio, we can just um, have the skeleton ready for different APIs. We can publish those APIs on the portal with the documentation. Or another example I can give you is suppose we have building an error handling app or maybe an email notification, something kind of app. So that is something which is generic. Uh, and it can be used by, I think, um, all, the entire organization for keeping the error handling or maybe the email notification stuff standard. So an API portal will definitely help us to keep a check, or keep account on the number of APIs been produced, uh, consuming it. And also, if we are in limit for with the number of APIs, we are also it also becomes easy to manage this API, secure these APIs. So. Yeah, and SLATR is something uh, we can use as well to manage and how we are going to like send out the request. Yeah. Yeah, completely agree with you. Yeah. So um, I, I actually have a lot more questions to ask. <laughs> uh, maybe we can also. Uh, so just to notify the attendees, the LinkedIn live stream didn't work and we changed the date for tomorrow and we just streamed this one tomorrow for our LinkedIn attendees, which is usually. Uh, at least 50 attendees. Uh, so okay. tomorrow there will be a real live stream of this one. But uh, for now, we just left with three minutes. And uh, I really want if any of the attendees has any question that they want to ask. Uh, so you have your the q and on the webinar and we'll be happy to get any kind of uh, questions of what we discussed or any topics that interest you. So uh, by the time that uh, someone may be typing or not, I'll cover briefly some topics that we plan to discuss, but we haven't got it that much. Uh, one of that is uh, pricing. I think it's something, uh, Eyal, of course, mentioned it in the currency, but it's actually this currency as a direct conversion into the money that we are actually paying for APIs and the way that we need to think about it, the bills on APIs, on consuming APIs are exponentially grow for every startup. 
that I know for the last, or every startup or technology company that I know for the last uh, two years. Another thing is about standards. Are we going to see any kind of new standards? We have REST for long years. We have GraphQL for some years. And uh, maybe the API will get us more and more standard. That is also mm -hmm. something that uh, makes it really interesting and curious to see what the market will bring with. Uh, we discussed a little about uh, what Permi does and what Lunar does. So that's definitely something that you might want to extend. Think about fine-grained authorization. Think about put it the uh, put a, a Lunar middleware on the way that you are actually uh, consuming APIs. Um, think about caching if cost is if it's going to cost. If we are going to do a lot of unstructured uh, calls. Maybe we need to uh, define and design better the cache layer that we are doing with APIs. And uh, I think there are tons of things that are uh, left to discuss about, uh, but we are out of our hour. So I, first, I really want to thank all of our attendees today, Eyal, for joining us, Akashta. I know um, actually now it all works for you in the time zone. So I'll not give the uh, <laughs> apology and play <laughs> for you or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so great to have you all and thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank for you so much for having us. Okay. It, it was it was a wonderful experience meeting you all. Thank Bye. you. Uh we got the question. I'm question. not sure. With AI empowering the integration of tool with minimal resource company can easily build the API. Can this be threat to most mules of developers? I guess we'll see, but from what I see. MuleSoft and Salesforce are growing better than ever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely not going to be a threat. So yeah. no worries. At least not as of now. And for yeah. future, if it's going to be a threat for MuleSoft developers, I'm sure it's going to be a threat for all the developers, not just MuleSoft. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so with these words of hopes, we will uh, hopes. <laughs> start off today. <laughs> yeah. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.